So you see a, a Russian and Chinese disinfo campaign uh, around these bioweapon labs linked back to COVID and the idea of, well, maybe the U.S. did create COVID in a lab and send it to China, which is like a popular theory. Uh, you know, and, and then you see that on Russian domestic news with VGTRK, but you also see it on RT and you see these these you know, various journalists from both organizations getting these emails kind of backing that that sort of stuff. Uh, and you see scripts that would, you know, that would be written or that were very similar across different Russian state media that are supposed to be somewhat independent, even though they're all ultimately run by the state. And so it does show the, the degree of coordination there. I'm Catherine Pompilio, Associate Editor of Lawfare, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, December 29th, 2022. On December 15th, the New York Times published an article that detailed an investigation conducted by three of its reporters into how Russian state media uses American right-wing and Chinese media to portray the ongoing war in Ukraine to Russian citizens. The investigation utilized thousands of leaked emails from correspondents within a Russian state media agency and with Russian security services to uncover how the Kremlin crafts its narratives and spreads disinformation to its people. To unpack the findings of the investigation and their implications, I sat down with the journalist that conducted the investigation, Paul Moser, a New York Times correspondent focused on technology and geopolitics in Asia, Adam Ceturiano, a New York Times technology correspondent focused on digital policy, and Aaron Krolik, an interactive news journalist and developer also at the Times. We discussed how they conducted their investigation, Russia's propaganda machine that they describe as the country's greatest wartime success, the limits of the disinformation campaign, and more. It's the Lawfare Podcast, December 29th, an investigation into Russian state media and disinformation. We're here because last week you published an article in the New York Times entitled An Alternate Reality, How Russia State TV Spins the Ukraine War. In a few sentences, could you just broadly describe what the article's about? Yeah, so it's it's basically a story about how Russia's domestic state media and state television in particular, which is so important for how many Russians think about the war and about their own country, used an incredibly sophisticated process by which it sort of pulled in information around the world, um, and in particular memes from the United States, uh, social media posts, and uh, you know a lot of cable news clips uh, to create a kind of alternate reality uh, for domestic viewers that portrayed the war as something which uh, a lot of the world supported, that, that, that Russia was constantly on the brink of winning, and that you know the, the embargoes and various responses you saw from Europe and the United States were kind of causing chaos over there and turmoil and something that they couldn't necessarily put up with for very long. Um, and so what we saw with these emails is a real inside look at how that was put together. You got to see the producers and journalists talking. Uh, you got to see the kind of raw material and, and see them kind of toss it around. So it was just this fascinating glimpse at, at, at you know kind of lifting the curtain on a process we don't normally see. Yeah. So you mentioned that this campaign was revealed in emails sent back and forth between producers that work for a Russian state media company. I'm curious to know how you came across these emails and why you decided to write about them. So the emails were released by um, a group called DDoS Secrets. They publish leaked and hacked documents. These were hacked as part of a campaign by Anonymous. So a group of hackers gained access to their system They've been available for a while, but because there's so many emails, um, hundreds of thousands of emails, and they're in odd formats, and it's hard to look through it, it takes a lot of time and resources to go through them. So we started a few months ago really looking into the emails and found interesting things, but it's a very long process of processing the emails, going through them you know, one by one, building tools to search and narrow down the results into interesting timeframes and keywords and them building a narrative around that. Yeah, so I wanted to dig into that process a little bit. How did you verify that the emails were legitimate? And how did the search engine work? What was that process like? Yeah, it's an important question. Uh, that We took a number of steps to, to verify the documents. One was to see that individuals who were communicating with one another through the emails actually existed we were able to cross-check some of the email addresses. And then I think the most important thing that we saw was in the emails, there were scripts uh, that were traded between uh, the state media journalists and the producers 
And then we could see those scripts ultimately end up on the air verbatim. Uh, and so that gave us a level of confidence that these documents were authentic and worth reporting. I'll also add that there's generally a lot of red flags that you look for when you're looking at a data set that came from sort of one computer system. You want to make sure that all the files are created by the same operating system or you know the attachments look right or that the email addresses line up in a certain way. And it's not proof that the emails are authentic, but there would be red flags that we check for as a heuristic to when we start out to just get, gain a sense of how authentic we think it is. But it's mostly checking against the private data, against how it would appear in the public record. And so in the article you wrote, the emails provide a rare glimpse into a propaganda machine that is perhaps Russia's greatest wartime success. Uh, could you unpack this statement a little bit? It was really striking to see that so much of the news and what we're seeing happen in Ukraine has been Russia underperforming uh, on the battlefield. They uh, are facing a number of battlefield losses. Casualties are mounting. They're isolated economically. Internationally, they're facing condemnation. But this was one piece of their wartime machine that seemed to be humming with precision. And it is perhaps the most one of the most important ones because it's the way in which what's being conveyed to the Russian public itself and sort of any uh, hopes and dreams that those in the West said that the longer this war dragged on, it would sort of chip away at Vladimir Putin's hold on power. Uh, the propaganda apparatus was kind of a buffer against that and pushing against it. And so would you say that it's working in, in terms of Putin trying to maintain domestic support? It's it's hard to know entirely, but I think there, you know, some of some of the people we've talked to have said that, you know, there are cracks there. But at the same time, um, you know, if you can imagine some of the filter bubbles you have in the United States, except there's only one side, you know, so imagine there is only Fox News or there is only MSNBC, and that's all the entire public is subject to without another side uh, that has an impact. And, you know, over 60 percent of Russians continue to sort of see television as their dominant source of news. And so this has, a you know, a tremendous impact on how people view the world and especially Especially, you know, away from some of the more cosmopolitan centers, uh, you know, sort of places like Moscow. Uh, but, you know, if you get if you get further away into Siberia and other places, you know, again, people are a little bit less connected and a little more provincial. And in, and in those those environments, this is incredibly important for people. This is their window to the world. Absolutely. And so how would you say that Russian language plays a role here? And speaking of language, how are, are certain terms being deployed in these in this messaging, so such as like special military operations or other forbidden words such as war and how they're presenting the war in Ukraine? I mean, you can't look at what's happening in propaganda in, in a vacuum. I mean, there's sort of, it's one side of, 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 of two coins. On the other side of it is a sort of brutal physical crackdown with the police and security services, which is sort of putting in a, a culture of fear that contributes to the sort of political support, if you will, of uh, of the war. And sort of the propaganda is more the softer power piece of it. On the other side, you see the harder crackdown of protesters of and other opponents of the war, where there isn't really a space to push back. And you can find that with the kind of crackdown on, on internet freedoms as well. And the, the, and the space for opposition is really shrinking or, or non-existent. On the Russian language portion as well, I think one of the probably more interesting parts was watching the ways they would selectively translate uh, various pieces of, you know, say Fox News or Tucker Carlson, you know, or other local news broadcasts. Um, and oftentimes the American broadcasts, believe it or not, would have more nuance to them and have a little bit more of a kind of mixed uh, idea around them, both, you know, stuff from Fox News as well as stuff from from local news. But, but in the way that it would sort of be translated into Russian, it would flatten that. And so you would just, you know, you get basically just pull quotes that are often, uh, you know, in, in some cases, slightly out of context, in other cases, incredibly out of context. You know, and one example of that was, you know, it shows how deep they were reaching into American life, but they go to this local 
uh, a news station in, in northern Alabama in Huntsville. And they they see that people are putting stickers that say with Joe Biden's face that say, I did that on the on the gas pumps. Um, you know, and it's an interview. It's a classic local news piece with a kind of uh, bemused uh, manager who says, like, please don't put those stickers on there. I, I respect your right to say what you think. But like, I worry about corporate inspections. And you know, it's kind of this it's charming for our era piece of local news. But, you know, when that comes into within two days, you know, that's on Huntsville local ABC affiliate within two days that's on Russian national news and all that's quoted is simply you know people are putting stickers and the guy says I pull five or six of them off the pump each day and that's the end of it so you know what you see as a sort of partial functioning of, of civil society in America to the degree it's still working is there and then and then the Russian news process kind of naturally strips that away into its you know most bare components to tell the story of an America kind of fraying at the seams. Yeah, absolutely. So to take a step back, just for people that are unfamiliar, could you talk a little bit about what VGTRK is, its purpose, its operations, and and just generally its connection to the Kremlin? Yeah, VGTRK is the largest state-owned media company in Russia. It owns television stations, radio stations, uh, and has a, a fairly robust online operation as well. It is it very closely linked to the Kremlin and is kind of a, a, a mouthpiece for state propaganda. And it, it sort of has a, a history that goes back uh, a number of decades, but the links between state television and the Kremlin has really intensified under Vladimir Putin. We learned about how there is every day uh, kind of a memo that is sent to uh, owners of, of uh, operators of the state television uh, broadcasters, which is called the Tepnik, which is the uh, kind of themes uh, the, and talking points that the Kremlin wants hit on, whether positively or negatively, ideas to support, individuals to criticize. And um, you can see how those sort of permeate through uh, different areas of the state television apparatus. And some of the people from uh, the broadcaster have moved into other areas, like RT is now run by a former Kremlin journalist who worked for VGTRK. And so you can see their influence throughout the state television. Yeah. And so, as you mentioned, the strategy didn't come out of nowhere. What playbook is Putin drawing from? And what types of past experiences, experiments, or test cases informed this media strategy? I mean, I think a lot of what you saw in these emails was very classic. I guess you would you would think uh, I, my I, my experience is coming out of China, and a lot of it felt very familiar in a way because um, it just feels very kind of uh, you know it feels like it in a way it would cast back to the Soviet era, but it also feels familiar um, in terms of China state media as well, and. You know, and it, it's a kind of classic disinformation game where you mix uh, very reliable sources like a statement from the White House or, you know, official German foreign ministry broadcast with things that are a little bit more on the fringe, like, say, a Tucker Carlson post and then something that's just outright false, like a, a random social media post that shows, you know, food off the shelves in, in the United States. And you kind of blend it all together. So it feels very sort of classic disinformation in a way where you sort of form this bricolage of of stuff that that some of which seems very reliable, some of which you're not sure about. And it just creates this this sort of alternate picture of the world. And um, you know, this is something that even within within sort of the Putin era, you know, we see go goes back with the Internet Research Agency and others. Uh, you know, this has long been something that they've they've been quite adept at. And, you know, in particular, uh Putin's background with the KGB and and you know its successor, the FSB, is very relevant there. And and it's sort of probably worth at this point bringing up another aspect to this, this which is fascinating, which is that within these emails, you could see the FSB itself sending emails, you know, calling the state media workers colleagues uh, and saying, hey, colleagues, here's a clip from, you know, of us arresting a would be terrorist in Crimea, you know, please play this video or play it after this day, or like, make sure you broadcast this. Uh, and, and then, you know, it would include a video that would show a certain thing. And so you do see that the state security apparatus is is kind of a core part of this as well. And so in a way, it feels kind of a piece of that broader intelligence operation 
uh, that's kind of ongoing alongside it. And the Ministry of Defense, of course, also is emailing the state media uh, constantly, you know, kind of telling them as well, hey, play this, play that. Uh, You know, we saw early in the war when when the Russian government was kind of predicting that Ukrainians would throw down their guns and and turn to the Russian side. The first day of the war, of course, the, the Ministry of Defense is sending video broadcasts of Ukrainians throwing down their weapons at border checkpoints and coming over and saying, see, here it is, you know, here's the evidence. So so all of this kind of runs together and, and it does feel like, you know, there's just a long, long history stretching back into the Soviet Union and into the sort of security agencies and the intelligence agencies that all kind of forms this very, you know, expertly crafted recipe for disinformation uh, that's being just directed directly at the uh, the Russian people in a way that they can't really escape from because there's not much, there's not many other sources of, of information at this point for Russians, especially if you're a little bit further away from Moscow, St. Petersburg, the major urban areas. Yeah, absolutely. And so to get a picture of, of how VGTRK is working, did you say there are just thousands or however many workers just combing the internet to find videos and audio that could potentially be used as propaganda? Or what is, is it mostly sent from Kremlin or security agencies? What surprised me is in some ways, it, 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 when you look through the emails, it was very like a, a normal television channel kind of in journalistic operation. There's lots of emails being shared about some potential stories to pursue, but it was kind of the, the buffet that they were choosing from was very selective in terms of the clips from American media or what uh, social media accounts they're selecting from, but otherwise they're creating scripts. They're sending them back and forth, uh, emails saying, add this, remove that. They're getting messages from the FSB and other areas of the government, but they're written in a matter of fact way that's almost as if they're getting a normal government announcement. But when in fact, it's like, here's a pretty blatant attempt at disinformation about something that kind of counters the reality on the ground. And so you have what is in some ways a very normal, like inside look at a, a television channel, but on the other side is sort of a uh, sort of a funhouse mirror because it's sort of so distorted in terms of what they're projecting to the millions of people who are watching their channels. Yeah, like imagine a Bloomberg uh, News or Reuter News Digest each day going out, but in place of, you know, your spot oil prices and election results and statements from Angela Merkel or something, uh, you just have dozens and dozens of right-wing YouTube channels supporting theories about bioweapons labs in Ukraine. And, and you know, you identify that Roger Stone has joined in the chorus and here he is. And here's the Chinese, uh, you know, uh, uh, foreign ministry spokesman backing it in this way. Uh, and so it's just this, it is this, you know, funhouse mirror version of news media where instead of, you know, uh, what we would think of as verified stuff, it's, it's, it's cherry picking the best pieces of the internet and cable news and other things from around the world to put forward the Russian, uh, narrative to its own people. And it is, a, it's a remarkable how, how, how sophisticated and capable, uh, they were at doing that. It's quite a daily news roundup in my inbox. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So I know you touched on this a little bit, but just to establish what types of media does VGTRK pull clips from and why why more conservative outlets and, and lesser known fringe media? So Tucker Carlson is a real favorite. Uh, you know, he's sort of constantly coming up in those, those sort of news digest emails. And, uh, you know, it's to the point where it's so sort of casual about it. You know, we, I just, we were kind of tickled by this line just simply for how casual it was, was to say, you know, don't forget to take Tucker today. Uh, you know, and, and it's, and, and it's sort of the producers writing to one of their American, uh, reporters telling them that, but, you know, you see a lot of these, uh, You know, honestly, I've been pretty far away from American, especially like cable and alternative television news, uh, having, you know, not lived in the United States since the George W. Bush administration. So for me, it was a little bit of like, you know, it was revelatory in a way, but there's uh, what's called Real America's Voice, I think is one that was there. Um, And you see, you know, them interviewing Roger Stone talking about the bioweapons. Uh, the bioweapons lab in Ukraine, which was a very popular uh, kind of conspiracy theory early in the war. You see, you know, a a whole kind of cast of other very, very right-wing type shows that honestly I'd never heard of before. 
and uh, but but do seem to be fairly popular. You know, hundreds of thousands of of views per video on on YouTube. What was fascinating is you know, and, and I think we know we all know to some degree the way the um, you know sort of especially far right talk radio and talk news has kind of veered towards these narratives around Russia that that you know sort of argue at least in some attempts to sort of say, you know, in some, in some ways, an effort to kind of justify what Putin's doing as, as the fault of the United States. And in particular, because uh, Biden is president at the moment to blame Biden and say that it's Biden's fault for not being tough. And, you know, Afghanistan and the, and the withdrawal there showed weakness. And this is why Putin came in. So there's all these kind of classic talking points. And, uh, you know, one of the really interesting things to me is that when you see these, uh, you'll see strange, very right wing positions out of Russia and from Putin and others, you know, where things like the fear of the feminization of the Russian people and a rejection of American wokeness as kind of weakening all of Russia. And I was always somewhat confused at where that was coming from. But after these emails, you see that, you know, a lot of what's getting piped into the daily Russian news diet is in fact, uh, uh, that sort of American, uh, very far right kind of, you know, news broadcast ecosystem. So in a way, it feels like they're kind of you know, to some degree getting, getting turned by their own propaganda somewhat, which I thought was kind of fascinating, but what's, you know, what else is telling about it is the others who are alongside these guys, um, you know, a lot of Chinese state news and state media uh, on the other side, you know, and a lot of these, these same pundits would sort of, you know, inveigh against uh, China, but, you know, there you have Roger Stone on one side backing a bioweapon conspiracy. And then on the other side, you have Zhao Lijian, who's a spokesperson for the Chinese foreign ministry, who's, you know, clipped multiple times. And, you know, oftentimes they're, they were quite fastidious about pulling out a number of different pull quotes that could be used each day for him, from him as well to back it up. And so you see this like weird quilt of like right wing American media and Chinese state media uh, combining, and then you just cherry pick weird stuff from social media. So again, like this weird Telegram account that I'd never heard of called like, I think the Real American or something or America Today. And, and it, you know, shows empty shelves at a Walmart. And so I guess the idea was that, you know, America was running out of food after its embargo and, you know, people were panic buying. So yeah, it's just a, a, a really weird and interesting mix of clips um, that does show the kind of breadth uh, and a real sophistication in terms of their ability to dig all this stuff out. Yeah, and I want to get into um, what did they pull from from Chinese state media, um, and how are they trying to portray China and its relationship with uh, Russia and the ongoing war in Ukraine? Yeah, China's presence in the me- in these emails was was some of the most fascinating stuff because in some ways it, it sort of they were trying to convey to the Russian public that they had at least one other strong ally, as they're being increasingly isolated elsewhere uh, by Europe, by the United States, and by the West, uh, they tried to point to China as being at its side and supportive of the war. And so there's a few different themes that that, that hit on. One was the biolabs theory that Paul had mentioned, that, that the United States was in, as it was had bioweapons labs in Ukraine. And the other was sort of the effect of the sanctions sort of slingshotting back against the United States and the West. And so you could see them sort of cherry picking different ways in which they were trying to, to, to use China as a, as a, as a sign of support. There was this very funny moment in the, in the emails in which they're trying to organize a gift to get to, uh, to one of China's top state television propagandists. And they're kind of going back and forth about how to get them this gift, which is a, a, a book of different reworkings of Russian artists and how to get it through the checkpoints to get past all the COVID restrictions in China in time for his birthday, which is coming up. So it's this funny moment of how they're trying to curry favor with their counterparts in, in Beijing. Yeah, the Chinese are also portrayed as an economic ally. So there's a lot about sort of the Chinese buying Russian goods. And there was one really great quote that was, I think it was something along the lines of, you know, buy a piece of candy from Russia and pay for a bullet to be sent to the Nazis or something like that, you know, so, it, you know, against the Nazis. So you do see this other side where it's, you know, the whole world may be turning on us economically, but we have this giant in China in our corner. Aaron, you created a search tool to go through all of these emails. And according to the article, it's 750 gigabytes worth of files that span from January to March 2020 to First of all, wow. Second of all, how did you do that? Uh, what was the process like building it? And what were you looking for? What was your process creating the search tool? 
this is, I think, our third story working on a data set like this. So we've sort of developed a pattern at this point of um, how to approach these sorts of things. One of the challenges is that these hacks are usually pretty disorganized. So there's a lot of manual work of just sifting through it and standardizing all the data. The data goes into, yeah, search tools, custom software to parse the text and make it searchable. I think that the real power comes from, you know, the editorial judgment that we put on top of it. So most of our efforts were focused on analyzing text that was sent, you know, in the lead up to the war, uh, during the war finding people of interest, then, you know, zeroing in on messages that they sent. It's it's really technology combined with our news judgment that makes it possible to analyze this amount of data. Aaron has the patience of a saint because, you know, we, we would get a set of, you know, we'd create a set of search terms. He created this bespoke software to go find it all. Then we'd say, actually, like we found this other thing. Can you search for this? And they'd be like, oh yeah, and I found this. Can you search for that? And then you get a new, you know, a new, a new set of results, go through that and do it again. So there's this iterative, you know, process where we're barraging Aaron with new ideas and, you know, he's then, you know, pulling it on and getting it together and, 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 you know, giving us the sort of thoughts on what it looks like and, you know, what might be there. And then we do it again. And so that was, that's the process. And it, just, yeah, incredible amount of work um, and patience uh, to kind of extract this stuff. What were some of those uh, search terms? I'm curious. Well, I mean, Tucker Carlson became one, right? I mean, yeah. you know, once we saw Don't Forget to Take a Tucker, you were like, oh, well, let's let's do a Tucker thing. So, you know. I mean, exactly. I mean, this is the um, third or fourth story. We've done a series of stories about kind of Russian surveillance, censorship, and, and propaganda. And, and the sort of it's really shown the power of software and these sorts of things because you have these immense data sets that would be almost impossible to go through manually. I mean, just imagine getting a hands on a sort of corporate email. You just you, where do you even begin? And so we we are focusing on individuals that we identified as having some sort of important roles. We did a lot of keyword searches around events. The emails went much further back, but we we narrowed the focus to basically between January and March when the, the emails end, because we just wanted to see what the, the information was flow about the lead up in the early days of the war. Uh, so we are looking for at events like Mariupol, we were looking for things like Tucker Carlson, Roger Stone, but also things that were referencing bio labs or uh, certain Chinese state media. And so the, the to be able to use what Aaron created was really amazing. Yeah, our approach mostly started with finding, because all the emails have dates, so there is structured data that you can query specifically. So starting with key events and seeing how the emails reacted to those key events and then spending time reading them, building out search terms, searching, reading, building out more search terms, and then organizing them into a narrative. And how long did all of this take? I think we started in the summer. Wow. Congrats. Getting it done. <laughs> in the article, you mentioned that uh, VGTRK is attempting to spread disinformation to other countries outside of Russia. What does this look like? Where are they targeting? I think so. A lot of what um, I wouldn't say they're the kind of primary vehicle for that at all. I think it's kind of a, a secondary thing. Um, you know, they, their channel is is broadcast in a number of European countries, and we see a lot of sort of concern and angst as the war breaks out, and a lot of those uh, various countries write to them and tell them it will no longer be broadcast, and they sort of puff their chest out out at moments that, you know, they, they say that the, to the Latvians, they had a, 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 they tried to create an air of ironic condescension uh, in the statement they wrote to the Latvians, you know, when the Latvians are telling them you're off the air. But I think uh, a lot of what you see, you know, RT and others are much more sort of focused overseas, but, but what you see is a cohering of certain narratives and a backing of the same narratives that are going overseas. And so there's a kind of consistency about it. And a lot of the emails uh, that are coming from the FSB and the, the Ministry of Defense, you know, and also just a lot of the talking points in these incredibly in-depth kind of bulletins of, of 
of of U.S. news and 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 and, and memes and things are are echoed by RT and and come in in other disinformation campaigns. So you know. Earlier in this year, before we were even on this, I wrote about a Chinese disinformation campaign around the bioweapons labs uh, in Ukraine and the way that the Russians and the Chinese were cohering on this, you know. And so, so you see a, a Russian and Chinese disinfo campaign uh, around these bioweapon labs linked back to COVID and the idea of, well, maybe the U.S. did create COVID in a lab and send it to China, which is like a popular theory, uh, you know, and, and then you see that on Russian domestic news with VGTRK, but you also see it on RT and you see these, these you know, various journalists from both organizations getting these emails kind of backing that, that sort of stuff. Uh, and you see scripts that would, you know, that would be written or that were very similar across different Russian state media that are supposed to be somewhat independent, even though they're all ultimately run by the state. And so it does show the, the degree of coordination there, you know, and, and the ways that everything is kind of working in sync, you know, and all the gears are kind of meshing together, uh, you know, and, and they're not the main kind of like loudspeaker shouting abroad necessarily. They're much more important domestically, but they do shed a light on how all this stuff kind of comes together and how it's all of a piece in a way. Yeah. And so you mentioned that they were tracking how they were being perceived abroad. What was it like going through those communications? And and why do you think that they were doing that? I mean, it's kind of standard practice. I mean, to, to Adam's point about the the kind of not mundanity, but the, the way things seem kind of normal for such a kind of, you know, propaganda behemoth. You know, this is what you do if you're in PR, right? You you get your news clippings, and and you know, these were news clippings for very powerful uh, propagandists. And what you see is is an incredibly sophisticated operation that's pulling. Uh, to me, what was most amazing is just the the breadth of of clips they were pulling. So they were pulling from like a, a Nicaragua based free Cuban newspaper. You know, they're pulling from Stern, the German. Uh, magazine, you know, that, that sort of, you know, weekly news magazine, they're pulling uh, from Nigerian sources. And and you just get these lists, you know, by dozens and dozens of links that reference various anchors, uh, and then just sort of broken down into negative, positive, neutral, and kind of going through and, you know, as the war, obviously, you know, if you're a West, you know, if you were, if you were a sophisticated PR person tracking what's happening to one of the chief propagandists of the Russian state around the time the Ukraine war breaks out, you're going to see a lot of red and negative stuff <laughs> coming in. And so it's just hilarious to kind of watch it, you know, like five, five references, four references, three references, and it's like 20 references, all negative, 18 references, negative, 14 references, negative. And, you know, you just see them just getting blasted from all sides. Um, and so, I mean, I think, I think probably, it was part of a more sophisticated operation years ago when there was more of an effort at soft power. But once the soft power battle had been mostly lost uh, when they decided to invade Ukraine, uh, at least in you know in the Western countries, um, you know that was quite interesting. But it is also interesting because you know you see places like India and other other parts in you know, the kind of non-aligned countries of the world that that aren't necessarily you know, knee jerk against it in the same way. And so you know they are also looking for openings there, and, and this helps them to do that. Yeah. And so in the article, you referred to VGTRK as a, or that you said that the emails showed a quote, organization grappling with Russia's growing isolation. Were these those materials that you were talking about? Or if not, what did they look like? And what did they say? Yeah, those are, that's what we are referring to in terms of thinking about correspondence internally about how to deal with having satellite channels, their satellite channels in European countries cut off how they're being perceived uh, abroad, and even thinking about what they're going to do about Eurovision, which is the popular singing competition and uh, that Russia was kicked out of. Uh, it's a major television event. And so if you're a broadcaster, who's no longer going to be able to have your home country being part of it. What does that mean? And so it's interesting to see how they think about these things. And, and I think also a part of it, thinking about how they're being perceived abroad is 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 maybe an early warning system of what could eventually come domestically. And they're very, I think they're very concerned about what it could mean for how some of the being perceived domestically and the trust in the in the news and the emails that we see go until March, which is still fairly early in this in this conflict. But as the months have dragged on and and, and Russia's performance on the battlefield has been pretty pretty dismal by many accounts. Does the trust in the news uh, that people within Russia are seeing deteriorate if it's so 
counter to what they can experience if more people are coming home killed or injured. People are using VPNs more and more to get access outside information. And so the sort of hold of state media, there are certainly cracks in it. And so I think that over time, the longer this war drags on and the realities of it come home, the kind of trust and power of the state media apparatus is really going to be put to the test. Yeah, I think that plays in my next question was, what were the limits of the disinformation campaign? As you mentioned, you know, like people are kind of, I don't know, uncovering the cracks. And and I seem to recall early on, I would hear of Russians that had family members in Ukraine that were hearing different stories of what was happening in, in email and WhatsApp. So are they, are they taking steps to combat that? What would you say like the biggest limits of the campaign are? I mean, I think the biggest limits is, is going to be reality. I mean, it, 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 it's sort of striking the, the lengths that Russia is going to when you look at what they're trying to do online, which is a subject of another story that we did. The, the Russian internet regulator, Roskomnadzor, uh, has been cracking down significantly on any criticism of the war, independent news websites, social media platforms, and so trying to sort of wall off any kind of uh, independent information that could be critical of the the so-called military operation, quote unquote. But there's holes in this and and, and whether or not they can plug these holes, I think it's is like a kind of a, a technological test. Whereas China, which Paul can talk about, was sort of built from the ground up with censorship in mind in terms of the internet. Russia was a fairly open and robust internet culture with open debate. But now as they're trying essentially to put that genie back in the bottle, uh, it's much harder to do and very labor and resource intensive. And there are basic services like VPNs that people are using. And so the access to outside information is going to sort of be the counterpoint to what they're trying to put forward and all these different blocks that they're putting in place. Yeah. Just to add to that, I mean, there's, I do think... I don't know if you know the, the classic Mitchell and Webb skit where the uh, they're sitting in, in a trench wearing, uh, you know, military helmets with skulls on them. And they say, are we the bad guys? Like, are we are we on the wrong side of this? And I think there's this constant effort, you know, to keep the Russian people from thinking that in a whole bunch of different ways. And, you know, when the world turns on them, you know, when we saw with our Roscom Nazor piece about Internet controls, they're carefully tracking discussions of why the world turned and they're tracking people who are sort of trying to be proud over Russian products. And they're, you know, they're bolstering that and, and trying to kind of, you know, watch very closely when people are complaining. Um, and and so, you know, one of my favorite moments in this, which I just thought was fascinating, was the Ministry of Defense. Some enterprising PR person in the Ministry of Defense for Russia uh, went around the world and filmed clips of basically men with rifles, militias that have cooperated with the Russian state in one way or another in Syria, um, you know, in various parts of Africa and South America. Uh, and get them just filmed them on camera saying they supported Russia and they want to come fight for Russia. And this is a righteous war against Nazis. Uh, You know, and it all comes in in this incredible sort of, you know, important three exclamation points email, you know, dear colleagues, colleagues with state media, play this, please. And, you know, it's and, and, and it's remarkable. They've gone around the world. They've done this incredible effort to just get, you know, fighters around the world to say that we support this war effort. Uh, and, you know, from, from outside, it looks very creepy, but from, from inside, you know, it looks like, oh, the war, the world is rallying around Russia. And so, yeah, you just see, it's just, it's incredible to watch those efforts. But again, you know, like Adam said, it, it runs up against reality and, you know, how many accusations can you have of atrocities before, you know, people start to listen and, and you would see the FSB would send email, you know, interviews, recorded interviews with people who supposedly saw the Ukrainians bomb the theater in Mariupol. Um, you know, you'd, you'd see this just to kind of cast a shadow of a doubt. You'd see dossiers of how Ukrainian war heroes are actually war criminals, you know, and, and, and then the FSB would send that on and say, don't quote us, but this is just a source. Here you go. So all of that is just, you know, it's just churning away and it's a lot to combat because there's a lot of reality that you have to push out there, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And so what were your main takeaways after completing the investigation? With this story and, and, and the others that, that we did this year about Russian censorship and surveillance is, 
I, I guess my the, the biggest takeaway is just the scale of it and the the level of resources and attention that go into kind of creating this alternative reality and to keep out outside information. And in some ways it's so normal. Like we had a similar batch of emails from the internet regulator. And what you see is this sort of normal day-to-day bureaucracy whose function is censorship. And within uh, Vegaterica, the state television channel, you see a day-to-day bureaucracy going to work, putting out the sort of state propagandist line. And it's very sophisticated, and it's a well-oiled machine. But in some ways, when you look into it and you get into the guts of it, it's just like a, 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 a normal apparatus going about its business. And to me, I found that sort of surprising and very, very interesting. Yeah, there's a real banality to it. And, you know, I mean, it makes sense in a way that that this is just like any other enterprise, you know, it's just turned in a different way and uh, tilted in a different aspect. I think one thing I'm always thinking about is just sort of, you know, we think about the ways that technology connects everybody and makes it very hard to hide the truth, right? Or, or, or mask videos, or, you know, we just think of things as incontrovertible. And I know, you know, in the United States, everybody's very well aware now that that's not, you know, what technology does. And technology has this incredible capability to contort these things, but it still remains remarkable to me. in in this, you know, era at this moment when people can travel across borders and, you know, can get a VPN to sign online and, you know, can have alternative news that, that these sorts of efforts are still so effective and so worth putting in, you know, efforts into it just, you know, in looking at China for me, it's always been amazing how, how well it, the sort of system of censorship works. And in this case, the, the way Russian propaganda uh, functions, is just remarkable you know, how effective they are and how good they are at it and how, how they found these sort of, you know, cross currents uh, in American culture to kind of sail along, to kind of attach their narratives to and, and kind of, you know, just sort of sew it into the fabric of American political life. It's, I mean, it's just so incredibly well done in a certain way, you know, and it's not necessarily, you know, there's no big malicious evil plan that's like, you know, conspiratorially plotting this out move by move. It's you see what's viral, you see what's going on, and you take a news news person's kind of, you know, mindset towards it each day, and you twist it and you like play with it, you know, and it's just, you know, it, it, it is remarkable. Um, and, and so the sophistication, yeah, for me is something that I, I was amazed by. And one of the, you know, one of the Russian reporters, Denis Davidoff, at one moment, he just identifies this uh, YouTube video that's going viral that, you know, is from, uh, it's basically a professor blaming NATO for causing the the war and, you know, for, for getting too close to Russia and prompting this invasion. You know, and he's, he sort of identifies it and it's kind of before it's gone super viral. And he says, you know, this video is seven years old, but there are hundreds of comments over the past two weeks the American people are seeking alternative facts, you know, and this is a man who's based in DC. He's their DC correspondent, you know, and, and, and what is he doing? He just has this sort of, you know, Hawkeye, you know, out kind of looking for these sorts of things that you can, you know, these strands, these phrases that you can just tie something to and, and, and knit in. And, uh, and yeah, it's, it's remarkable to see on the inside. Aaron, was there anything that surprised you about what you uncovered in the database? I think, yeah. Paul and Adam covered it, but it's pretty amazing to see the human side of these big bureaucracies. And, you know, you can, New York Times is, you know, maybe not all that different with its emails and personalities. And you can just sort of imagine yourself in there. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting to see how it all comes together on a human level. Absolutely. So where is this disinformation campaign likely headed, in your opinion? I think it's only going to in, in, intensify and, and continue, and I, I'm, I'm very curious to see what tools and, and efforts are created to counter it. Uh, you've heard you hear sort of some Russian independent media outlets coming up with different software tricks so their websites can't be blocked, creating apps that can be downloaded for for televisions or for phones that that sort of have a certain signals in a way where, where they're much harder to block but um, at the same time i think the, the russian efforts are going to become increasingly sophisticated as well 
and perhaps even more importantly as to what extent these things are copied elsewhere. You know, the, the, what's happening in Russia is likely a sign of things to come that are going to happen in other countries with leaders with authoritarian tendencies who are thinking about their own ways in which they can crack down on the internet or uh, independent media and independent information. And so in some ways, Russia is kind of a sign of things to come. And so for your reporting, uh, was there anything left on the cutting room floor that didn't make it into the article? Yeah, there's a ton. And, you know, I think a lot of it just has to do with these these sort of, you know, email back and forths, these just tiny sort of remarks and throwaway comments, um, the way certain scripts will, you know, they'll just toss in a line, you know, uh, about, uh, say, like, you know, like, uh, Zelensky, the like scum war criminal, like, you know, like, like video here, you know, and then that kind of stuff. I mean, it, it it's just sort of, I guess, seeing the, yeah, the, the back and forths and the ways that they talk about these things is remarkable. But, um, the, you know, the, the Latvian thing I really enjoy just cause that you saw, you know, you can kind of see the hurt, uh, in, in, in these, these sort of state media broadcasters who don't want to kind of show it, but sort of are trying to, to kind of keep their dignity as they, as they kind of get cut off from the world in a certain way and cut off from these international organizations that gave them so much kind of clout before. But yeah, and just so much, so much, so many really just fascinating, tiny little clips and memes and things. Uh, like I learned a lot about the American, <laughs> uh, you know, in particular right-wing media landscape that I was not aware of before <laughs> just digging into this stuff. So yeah, there's so much of that. I mean, one thing that sort of tickled me was the Eurovision stuff. I mean, in the, in the story, it's kind of a, a quick line, but there's a, a longer correspondence in these emails about getting lawyers involved and stuff like that. Among the sort of whatever pocket of people that was within the channel, they were they had some concerns about what this was going to mean for, for their Eurovision. There was also some emails that we weren't quite sure how ended up in there. So, I mean, there's some stuff I think that just as we went through the verification process and things like that, that we just felt a little, something didn't feel quite right about it. And so not that we didn't think it was real, but we didn't quite, we couldn't quite figure out how it linked to Vegaterica. And so we would leave those sorts of things out. We tried to be very careful. And this set of documents has already actually contributed to other projects. So there's pieces in our the Times is large Russia story this past week. So, you know, now that we have it in a searchable database, we can come back to it as it becomes relevant. Absolutely. Um, well, that's all I have for you today. Thank you all so much for, for joining me at a lovely time. Yeah. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. You can get ad-free versions of this and other Lawfare podcasts by becoming a Lawfare material supporter at patreon.com slash lawfare. That's patreon.com slash lawfare. You'll also get access to special events and other content available only to our supporters. Please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Look out for our other podcasts, including Rational Security, Chatter, Allies, and The Aftermath, our latest Lawfare Presents podcast series on the government's response to January 6th. Check out our written work at lawfareblog.com. The podcast is edited by Jen Patya Howell, and your audio engineer this episode was Jay Venables of Goat Rodeo. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. And as always, thank you for listening.